On October 25th, 2000, the animated series, as told by Ginger, debuted on Nickelodeon. It was a very unique show for its time, focusing on a teenage girl named Ginger Feltley and showcasing her friends, family, and perspectives of life of middle and high school. Now, 15 years, 60 episodes, including four TV movies later, it's time to look back and discuss about my personal top 15 favorite episodes of the series. Some of my older followers may remember that three years ago, I already did a list of my top 10 favorite episodes. Well, it's pretty outdated. There were some episodes that I watched that resonated with me at at the time, and others that I didn't know what I was thinking when putting it on the list. Before starting As Told by Ginger Month, I went back and saw every single episode again and wrote down the ones that left a huge lasting impression on me. Now keep in mind, if there are any episodes that you feel that should have been on the list, or if the episode should have been ranked higher or lower, just remember that this is my personal opinion. With that out of the way, let's get started. Number 15. A Lesson in Tightropes Ginger is told by her longtime best friend and boyfriend, Darren Patterson, that he wants to break up the relationship. Ginger is feeling really sad and heartbroken about the breakup and lies in her bed. However, this is just the beginning. When Lois, Ginger's mother, goes upstairs to check to see if she's alright, she finds Ginger with a high fever and clenching her abdomen. It turns out that she has appendicitis and was hospitalized. Meanwhile, Carl is upset about Ginger being hospitalized as well as worried that Lois and Dr. Dave will break up their engagement, especially since Jonas, their estranged father, has become more and more part of their lives. It's pretty low on this list because it's very melodramatic and depressing. It's understandable that something as severe as appendicitis should be treated very seriously, but it's a little bit too much at times. Even the montage where Lois is at the waiting room reminiscing about Ginger is very sad. It's kind of sad, really. Guess I'm the sword who linger. When the credits roll, I still can't leave a picture. The picture I hold in my heart. But it's on this list because of Carl's story. Learning more of his opinions of his father being neglectful in his life has developed his character a whole lot more. Especially throughout the entire series, he was mostly portrayed as the rambunctious, troublemaking, disgusting little boy. He becomes an even more relatable and sympathetic character in this episode. It's actually one of the very few episodes of As Told by Ginger that I prefer Carl's story as opposed to Ginger's. While the Wild Thornberries had a similar plot involving Eliza suffering from appendicitis, As Told by Ginger is better presented with a lot more at stake. It's a very important episode since the events that happened are referenced later throughout the remainder of the series. However, there are other episodes that are on this list that I enjoy a lot more. Number 14, Stuff Will Kill Ya. Ginger becomes more stressed with schoolwork with constant assignments and tests that she has to do. She doesn't know how to keep up with it until she hears one of the high school students talking about the Moco Loco Frothinator, which is a highly caffeinated espresso that gives a ton of energy when drinking it. At first, she does really well with her homework, but then she crashes and mostly sleeps a lot. She becomes even more addicted to the Loco Moco Frothinator and drinks more and more of it. Meanwhile, Carl wanders into a science teacher's refrigerator and looks around his stuff without his consent. The teacher, wanting to get revenge on Carl due to an incident that he caused to his daughter, makes up a lie that one of the items he had stored away would infect a person with a deadly disease that would kill them in 48 hours. This episode showcases on how severe addiction is. It's something that a lot of people can relate to in some way, shape, or form. Even when Ginger thinks that what she's doing is helping her, it's actually hurting her and making her situation even worse. I might ask you the same question. Me? I'm just getting a couple of Moco Loco Frothinators before I hit the books. How many of those things have you had today, Ging? I don't know. I had one for breakfast, or was it two, and then one at lunch. Wow. Mom, only because if I don't keep my sugar and caffeine levels steady, I might crash and burn, which could result in a failing mark, which could go on my permanent record, which could impact my ability to get into a good college. You want me to go to college, don't you, Mom? I don't believe this. I have a test tomorrow, and I wanted to stay up all night to cram for it. I can't be late in the morning, so I just figured I'd break night. Break night? I'll break neck if you don't toss those things in the garbage. Right now. But I didn't... Ginger, 
If our ifs and buts were candies and nuts, we'd all have a very merry Christmas. This isn't a topic that you would see portrayed in a lot of animated shows, and it's done really well here. The only other Nicktoon that comes into mind when discussing about addiction was Hey Arnold with the character Chocolate Boy. Number 13, Gym Class Confidential. In this episode, the gym teacher makes an announcement about the girls being assigned to watching a video about puberty. Macy is terrified on watching it since she's not fully comfortable about the subject. Meanwhile, Carl and Hoodsy attempt to break the world record of not showering the longest. However, they have a new gym teacher that informs the boys that they have to take mandatory showers after each class. Hoodsy refuses to do it, not because of ruining the chance of breaking the record, but because he's embarrassed of getting naked in front of everyone. This is a really great episode that delivers on the relatable fears that people go through, such as body image and fearing of growing up. Some people can't wait to grow up and look more like an adult. Others are fearful of the inevitable change and all the awkward events that occur in your body. We sometimes feel inferior when compared to the rest of society, and we would do anything to look perfect, or perfect according to what Hollywood says. Unlike most episodes of the series in which the stories of Carl and Ginger are standalone and different, the two conflicts here are complemented each other very well. This episode was even ranked number 97 on the top 100 moments of Nicktoon history back in 2007. So it just goes to show you that it left a bit of an impact on people. Number 12, Ginger the Juvie. The very first episode of As Told by Ginger starts off very strong. Courtney is throwing a surprise birthday party and she decides to invite ginger to the event miranda tries to find a way to prevent ginger from going to the party by suggesting to her to steal the enter sign from a bank to give to courtney as a birthday present ginger struggles with the decision of either going for it since she wants to look cool in front of courtney or giving her a cheap gift making her the laughing stock of the group she decides to steal the sign. Meanwhile, Carl and Hoodsy trick Courtney's little brother, Blake, into hanging out with them at their hangout place so they can use his treehouse to take photos of the party and use it to blackmail people. Blake eventually finds out about this betrayal, and he takes revenge by stealing Carl's most prized possession, the petrified eyeball. This episode does not only do a good job of introducing the characters, the setting, and the story, but it keeps you intrigued on what's going to happen next. Not to mention the ending in which Ginger is arrested thanks to Miranda's clever yet sadistic scheme. She did something in the first episode that Princess Azula from Avatar The Last Airbender couldn't do to Iroh and Zuko throughout season two. That's impressive. Truly one of the best episodes of a Nickelodeon show ever made. Number 11, Sleep On It. In this episode, Courtney is planning on her very first slumber party and invites all her friends, including Ginger, to the occasion. As usual, Miranda is not happy with Ginger stealing the spotlight, so she and another girl nicknamed Mipsy plan on playing a dirty prank on her. Meanwhile, Carl is invited to Blake's sleepover. He decides to use this as an advantage to steal back the petrified eyeball that Blake had stole from the first episode. However, Carl ruins his opportunity by releasing a powerful stink bomb comprised of rotten eggs at the bishop house. Carl then sends Hoodsy to take his place to complete the task. But Hoodsy has to deal with his personal issue of wetting the bed. It's your typical sleepover episode that you see in a lot of Slice of Life shows, but there are some quirky moments that make it memorable. One of my favorite moments is Courtney and Miranda's shock when seeing Ginger arriving to the sleepover on time. <gasps> well, Ginger, what are you doing here? I was invited, wasn't I? Yes, but it's 8.15. You said the party started at 8. You actually came on time? Oh, that's priceless. <laughs> <laughs> then there's this scene in which Ginger defends Hoodsy after he accidentally wet Courtney's floor. Oh. Truth or dare, Courtney. Now is not the time for party games. Fine. Be a chicken. <laughs> okay. Truth. Didn't you ever wet the bed when you were younger? Even just once? <gasps> of course not. It's disgusting. You know, if you're not going to tell the truth, you might just want to say, dear. Overall, it's a pretty good one that takes you back to the days of sleepovers at friends' houses. Number 10, Carl and Maud. This is the second episode of the series, and it's one of the fan favorites. After committing the crime of trying to steal the enter sign from the bank from the episode Ginger the Juvie, Ginger, Doty, and Macy begin their community service over at a nursing home while bringing Carl along with them. Carl wanders around and meets up with a high, strong, and troublemaking woman named Maud. They become fast friends and pull off a ton of pranks. Later on, Carl even falls in love with Maud, saying that she's the woman of his life. 
Meanwhile, Courtney invites herself over to Ginger's house for dinner. Ginger prepares the house to make sure that everything looks presentable enough for Courtney. But things get even more hectic when Carl invites Maude for dinner as well. This is another episode on the list that I prefer Carl's story as opposed to Ginger's. It's a very eccentric and quirky episode that's a lot of fun to watch. I won't spoil the ending, but let's just say it's pretty sad and it comes out of nowhere. This episode is a reference to the 1971 cult classic movie Harold and Maude, in which a young man who's obsessed with suicide falls in love with an older woman who's enthusiastic and looks at life positively. It was because of this As Told by Ginger episode that I eventually saw the movie four years ago. If you're into dark comedies and can put your suspension and disbelief of this odd pairing, I recommend that you check it out. It's a good movie. Number nine, Far From Home. There were four As Told by Ginger TV movies. The first one was The Summer of Camp Caprice. The second is this one. In this episode, Ginger is invited to spend a semester over at Avalanche Arts Academy due to her talent in writing. She accepts and she heads over to the academy where she makes new friends, including her roommate named Thea. All of her friends begin to start missing her, especially Courtney and Darren. Courtney starts hanging out with Dodie and Macy and, and to see if they could be similar to Ginger. Darren slowly starts to fall in love with her. Meanwhile, Carl and Hoodsy decide to sign up their new friend, Noelle Sussman, over to a freak show competition. They think that they can have an advantage due to Noelle having telekinetic powers. There's a lot more to the story that I dare not spoil. Let's just say that it's a huge improvement over Summer of Camp Caprice. It has a lot more storylines that are interesting to watch from beginning to end, and the development of the characters going through their trials and tribulations are really, really worth talking about. Especially with Ginger deciding if she wants to stay at the Academy full-time, Carl seeing more of Noelle as a person other than just an easy ticket to win the competition, not to mention him being jealous of Noelle and Hoodsy spending more time together, and Darren thinking about whether he should Confess his love for Ginger. This episode kickstarts season three, and what a way to start. Number eight, family therapy. Macy's 13th birthday is around the corner, and Ginger and Dodie want to plan on doing something special. However, it turns for the worse when her parents completely forgot all about it. When Ginger confronts Macy's parents and telling them about what they did, they feel guilty and start giving her a lot of attention and planning a special party for her. It becomes even more strange when they start treating Macy like a four-year-old, doing everything from buying a toddler playground set and having her party set in a petting zoo. Ginger feels that Macy should tell her parents to treat her like a teenager, but Macy is loving the attention that she's been receiving. Meanwhile, Carl and his classmates go on a field trip to the zoo, where they see a naked mole rat. Carl picks one up, but ends up dropping it where he crawls up into his pants and eventually escapes from his confinement. Carl admits to Hoodsy that he was scared of the naked mole rat and is living in fear that it'll find him again. What makes this episode so captivating is Macy's story. Throughout the series at that point, we had never seen her parents. They're always busy at work or they're always out of town. So the fact that she's finally getting attention from them, despite the fact that they're not treating her age appropriate, is very sad. Even more ironic is that they're both psychiatrists, both for adults and children. And they're a bit clueless on what's best for their daughter, even so much as forgetting her birthday. Wow. But the way the events pay off is very well done and rewarding to boot. Number seven, losing Nana Bishop. Out of the three female protagonists and as told by Ginger, that being Ginger, Dodie, and Macy, Dodie is my least favorite. Episodes focusing on her tend to lean more of doing everything that she can do to become popular, even if it means making the people around her miserable. But this episode depicts Dodie as a very likable character and deals with a very heavy topic quite poignantly. Dodie gets the news from home that her grandmother had recently passed away. She feels absolutely devastated since she was very close to her. Ginger, after listening to Dodie's stories about her grandmother, wants to find out more information about her own since she never knew her. Meanwhile, Carl and Hoodsy purchase shackles and an iron mask so they can learn how to become escape artists. But they start having difficulty removing them when the keys to the items are lost. It becomes a bigger issue for Hoodsy when he has to give a speech about his grandmother at the funeral. It also doesn't help that he feels no sadness for her passing. This episode is one of my favorites because it's able to tackle in a subject such as death that is fully real. Here's a story. I had a cousin that I was distanced for a long time because she lived outside the country. We almost never talked to one another, and whenever she came on by to visit, I didn't really speak to her very often. But when she tragically passed away due to a bus accident a few years ago, I felt devastated, and I regretted on not talking to her more than I should have. For anyone who went through a loss, this episode is very relatable. To those who have yet to gone through one, just remember to love and appreciate all your friends and family and not take them for granted, because you never know when they'll be gone from your life, and you would have wished that you would have done a lot more. 
Number six, the nurse's strike. Out of all the characters featured in As Told by Ginger, my favorite is Lois. She's a fantastic mom to Ginger and Carl. She knows how to support her children with great advice and discipline, as well as being very funny. She's also struggling with what little she has to make sure that her kids are well off. But things get hectic in this episode when she's not getting paid well, and she participates in a nurse's strike for better wages. It becomes a bigger issue with Ginger and her classmates going on a field trip to New York City, and Ginger has yet to pay the money to attend. Lois decides to become a house cleaning maid until the strike settles down. Ginger feels embarrassed for her mother due to being afraid that her classmates will find out what she's doing for work. As time goes on, Ginger helps Lois out with cleaning the houses to pay off the fee for the trip. Meanwhile, Carl and Hoodsy also want to help with raising the money for the family by training the middle school principal's dog named The Duchess. No, not Duchess. The Duchess. The best thing about this episode is seeing Ginger and Lois interact with one another. They have wonderful chemistry together. They tell each other stories, jokes, they play cards, and they bond to the point of being best friends. They How about LNG cleaning to a T? Ah, too corny. And don't worry, I'll come up with something better. Uh, wait a minute, Ging. I don't know what you're thinking this is a permanent arrangement. I'm starting to worry there's a child labor law I'm violating. Maybe you're supposed to be getting a milk and graham cracker break every two hours or something. Chill, Lois. You're starting to sound like my mother. <laughs> they make this episode extremely memorable. This episode is one of many that showcases on why Lois is my favorite mom in Nickelodeon. Number five, come back little seal girl. This is one of the fan favorites of the whole series, and it deserves that statement. A talent show is coming up at Lucky Junior High, and Ginger, Dodie, and Macy want to perform a dance alongside with a song called The Little Seal Girl, a song that they've known ever since they were little girls. However, when showing a preview of the performance to Courtney and Miranda, they're a bit confused and mortified on the choice of talent they chose to showcase. They even hear other people talking about how the little seal girl is very juvenile and embarrassing. Ginger and Dodie eventually chose to drop out of the talent show, disappointing Macy greatly, claiming that they're breaking a tradition of doing things together. Meanwhile, Carl and Hoodsy's teacher, Mrs. Gordon, is bringing a mummified hand over to class to show her students. Carl is interested in shaking hands with it to see if the rumor of the hand being cursed is true. He takes the hand without Mrs. Gordon's knowledge, and when shaking the hand, some of the fingers snap off. He only has a short amount of time to fix the hand right before the presentation. The highlight of this episode is Macy. The pressure of letting childish things go because you're becoming a teenager is a topic that hits a lot of people right at home, including myself. When I was a teenager, I was getting more into anime, video games, movies, books, and I started going to my first convention. A lot of people made fun of me saying that I should get into more grown-up things such as shopping, makeup, or watching shows focused for my age. But I didn't care about those things because the stuff that I was watching or doing made me happy. And they left an impact on me in more positive ways than one. Plus a lot of the shows that they were recommending me to watch were all crap. Especially the reality shows. For a lot of my colleagues who are roughly around my age or even older, they have a passion for things such as movies, TV shows, video games, and cartoons. There are a lot of conservative people who look down on people like us, calling us immature slackers who refuse to grow up. First and foremost, we are normal human beings who have typical lives. We have jobs, we pay bills, we have families that we support, and we do responsible tasks every single day. A great example on this is from my colleague from Manic Expression, James, who discussed a few years ago on a Stop the Hate video on Childish Things. You know, they say that there's a time to set childhood things aside and grow up and become adults. Why? Why would you do that? What's your fucking problem? God! I think that the idea of growing up is tempting to a lot of people uh, because then they get to look down on people like me, people like you, you know. How many guys out there have had a girlfriend? who have said to them, oh, why do you play video games? Those are for kids. How many of you have had boyfriends who, you you know, you've got dolls, even if you're a girl, or if you're a guy too, whatever. You've got dolls or you've got 
uh, you know, stuffed animals or whatever, and they look at you and like, oh, you got all these stuffed animals for your grown woman. Childhood is not something that should have to end the way that it used to. It used to be that I think people forced their childhoods to end because their circumstances were so dire. You grew up and you didn't have time for anything but working in the coal mine, going down, down, down. And, you know, you couldn't, you came home, you had 15 kids and they were all starving. <laughs> you know, one of them's dying of malaria in the corner. You pretty much got to nut up and, you know, accept that your life is over, essentially, and that all you get to do for, for the rest of your life is provide and hopefully not die an early death. And um, that just isn't the world we live in anymore. For as bad as things can be sometimes, essentially, right now, we live in a pretty cozy time. And there are some drawbacks to that. Uh, I think I've discussed a lot of them in Stop the Hate. One of the upsides, though, is that we don't fucking have to grow up. Not the way we used to. I've got three kids. I take care of my kids, okay? If I choose after I cook dinner and we eat as a family to come into my room and chill out for 20 minutes playing a video game, there's nothing wrong with that. While it's true that we do need to let go of some childish things and move on with our lives, there are some things that we can't let go, no matter how old we are. To quote Mary Jo Putney, what one loves in childhood stays in the heart forever. Number four, the wedding frame. The fourth TV movie and final episode of As Told by Ginger has a lot going for it. The main plot features the final planning of Dr. Dave and Lois's wedding of choosing a dress, a church, and a honeymoon location right before the big event. However, Dr. Dave's mother doesn't want the wedding to go through, so she begins to sabotage their plans and hires someone named Nikki Laporte to portray as Dr. Dave's old girlfriend named Diane. I'm not going to go into too much details about Nikki Laporte, but let's just say she's not what she appears to be. Meanwhile, Carl and Hoodsy suspect that something's wrong with the wedding plans, as well as finding a picture of Dr. Dave with another woman. So they decided to investigate to see what's going on. Ginger is having second thoughts about her relationship with Orion after she starts building feelings for Darren again after their breakup. It tells a lot of stories that were built up from the entire series and brings it all to a close. This was one of the episodes from season three that had never aired on TV in the U.S., but it did air in Canada. I didn't see the special until about three years ago on DVD. I was confused when I first saw it due to the many events that had occurred between the last episode that aired on Nickelodeon, Fair Too Cloudy, and this. One of the things about As Told by Ginger that makes it so great is that it had a flowing narrative. You had to see every single episode in order for you to get to the story. It wasn't like most Nickelodeon shows at the time in which there were a lot of standalone episodes so that people can easily get themselves into the show, whether it be the first, the fifth, or the fiftieth. When I reran the show again to prepare for the Nickelodeon tribute and saw the movie again, everything made sense and it fit into place. There are a lot of twists, turns, throwbacks, and heartwarming moments that makes it worthwhile to watch. The thing that puts it on this list is the ending. It's so incredibly satisfying and it concludes the story on a great note. I dare not spoil it, but it's hands down one of the best endings of Nickelodeon history. If Avatar The Last Airbender didn't exist, then As Told by Ginger would have been number one. Number three, and she was gone. Whenever people talk about memorable As Told by Ginger episodes, this one will most likely be brought up. Ginger is writing a new poem for a writing competition, but she hasn't thought of anything to put down into words. Then one day she starts typing her manual typewriter the story of a lonely girl who wanders around alone, wanting to be gone from existence. She chose to walk alone, though others wondered why. Refused to look before her, kept eyes cast upwards towards the sky. She didn't have companions, no need for earthly things. Only wanted freedom from what she felt were puppet strings. She longed to be a bird, that she might fly away. She pitied every blade of grass, for planted they would stay. Some say she wished too hard, some say she wished too long, but we awoke one autumn day to find that 
she was gone. The trees, they say, stood witness. The sky refused to tell. But someone who had seen it said the story played out well. She spread her arms out wide, breathed in the break of dawn. She just let go of all she held, and then she was gone. When she reads the poem to her friends, they're very concerned for Ginger, thinking that the poem is based off of her going through suicidal depression. Even her teacher recommends for her to visit the school therapist and partake in a depression group gathering. Courtney even joins the group, dressing in black, dyeing her hair, and crying all the time just so she can regain her popularity. Ginger tries to tell everyone that the poem was not based on herself, but it was a work of fiction, but nobody believes her. Meanwhile, Carl and Hoodsy purchase vanishing powder and want to test it out to see if it works. They plan on using one of their classmates to do it, but they don't know which one. While they would have loved to use it on people such as Blake or another student named Brandon, they decide to use it on a student that they think that no one would miss. They chose a girl named Noelle Sussman, a person that even Carl didn't know who she was, even though that we would see her in the background throughout previous episodes. When Carl and Hoodsy do more research on Noelle, they found out that she was a weird, quirky, and hyperactive girl who's just as eccentric as they are. Carl regrets it and hopes that the vanishing powder didn't work. The next day, she doesn't appear in class, and they worry that she's gone forever. They start saving up money to buy a reappearing potion to bring Noelle back. What makes this episode so unforgettable is the poem that Ginger wrote. Not to mention the animation that goes alongside it. It's dark, creepy, angular, and atmospheric. Even the opening of the episode is so much different than the others. It showcases the mood that you'll be expecting to see later on. While I have said that the animation on As Told by Ginger is ugly looking, these segments look incredible and they take full advantage of Klasky Chupo's style. It's hands down the best animated segment in the entire series. It also introduces us to Noelle Sussman, who is interestingly enough voiced by the creator herself, Emily Kapnick. <laughs> This episode got As Told by Ginger nominated for an Emmy for an Outstanding Animated Program, alongside with King of the Hill, South Park, and The Simpsons. However, it lost to Futurama. While it's a shame that As Told by Ginger didn't win, there was some steep competition that it pretty much didn't stand a chance. As much as I love As Told by Ginger, Futurama deserved that win. Bottom line, this episode is fantastic, and one that people still praise to this day. Number two. Hello, Stranger. Here's another one that people bring up when discussing about a favorite As Told by Ginger episodes, and it deserves it. Ginger is writing a poem for her school, but can't decide on what topic it should be. When checking the mail, she receives a graduation card from her father. A few months late, but still, it's the thought that counts, whom she hasn't heard of in a while. She finds his phone number written at the card and decides to invite him over to the school event. Darren is skeptical about this because Ginger's father was very well known of not showing up due to complicated reasons. But Ginger believes that her father is more willing to get back to her and Carl's life, despite the numerous times he hadn't been around. Meanwhile, Carl orders a dehydrated sea steak to make so he can showcase it to show and tell. However, Lois finds it in the fridge, confusing it for lemonade, and drinks some of it. She starts getting stomach issues and eventually goes to the hospital to see if there's actually a sea snake growing inside her. Carl also ends up in the hospital when his classmate Brandon's pet monkey, Mr. Licorice, bites him and starts acting like a monkey, which means that neither of them are able to make it to the school event. The episode's main conflict about Ginger wanting her father back in her family's life is very down-to-earth and identifiable. It's not every day in animated shows that you see topics such as divorce tackled. Usually in animated shows, if there is a single parent showcase, then most likely the other parent is either non-existent to what the plot demands or dead. It was one of the many ways that As Told by Ginger took a lot of risk for Nickelodeon, dealing with issues that most of the shows didn't do at the time. Similar to And She Was Gone, one of the highlights of the episode is Ginger reading the poem. While a lot more simple in his presentation with Ginger reading the poem on the auditorium stage as opposed to black and white animation, it hits you really hard, especially if you have a parent that's not in your life due to circumstances you can't control. I will dare not spoil the ending to those who haven't seen it. Let's just say that it becomes bittersweet but heartwarming later on. 
Like and she was gone, Hello Stranger got as told by Ginger nominated for an Emmy for Outstanding Program, alongside with King of the Hill, Futurama, and the Powerpuff Girls. But it lost to The Simpsons. This episode is a classic, and I highly recommend to those who haven't seen it to check it out. Number one, for my older followers and even my newer ones who have been tuning into As Told by Ginger Month, you probably already know what my number one is. I even had it as number one on my old top ten list. When rewatching the show for the third time in four years, there was no other episode that captivated me so much with its storytelling, character progression, a look back to the past, and a step toward the future. Ladies and gentlemen, butterflies are free. There are so many things that I love about the third TV movie that I don't even know where to start. Well, I guess we'll start with the plot. It involves with Ginger and her friends counting down the days of their middle school graduation and entering into high school. She's very indecisive about it, particularly with them going to Lucky High and learning that their schedules were not going to have any of them in the same classroom. Plus, they decide to join in different after-school activities. Ginger starts fearing the change that will be occurring once they graduate, and she doesn't know if she can go through with it. She's also told by Ms. Zorsky to write a graduation speech, which puts even more pressure on her. Meanwhile, Carl and his classmates will be graduating from elementary school and entering into middle school. Their teacher gives an announcement about dropping something from their childhood into a time capsule, signifying the process of moving away from childish things and entering into teenhood. Wanting to act more mature for their transition into middle school, plus a suggestion by a crazy bird-obsessed girl named Polly, yes, her name is Polly, go figure, they decided to contribute to the time capsule. Blake gives away his removed tonsils, Brandon gives away his monkey tooth necklace, and Carl gives away his petrified eyeball. What makes this TV movie so great is that similar to The Wedding Frame, it brings up a lot of stories and plots from previous episodes and culminates it together so well. There are so many little moments that are shown that beautifully presents on how much the characters have grown and changed over the course of the show. Not to mention the important lesson of change and moving on toward the next step in your life, being told very well by both Lois and Jonas. Growing up is like dieting. There comes a point when your old clothes just don't fit you anymore. But the idea of giving up that old argyle sweater with the elbows worn out just so makes you want to cry. Until the day when you catch your new and improved reflection in that form-fitting number. And you think, hey, not bad. Suddenly it's not so hard to leave behind old Uncle Argyle. I'm the only one of all my friends who's not excited about moving on. Why is that? I don't know. Maybe because it involves letting go and I'm all about holding on. But you can't hold on too tight, right? Or else something that was born to fly might just... Die? Dad, let it go. I will. I was just making a point. See how beautiful that looks? Up there in the sky? I guess. Here's the thing. The tighter you hold on to something, especially something that needs change and growth, the more great a chance you stand of losing it. I think I might have learned that the hard way. But if you let it go, if you let it fly at the time that it most desperately needs to, well, there's a darn good chance it may come back to you. Again, the, the best thing about the movie is the speech that Ginger gives during graduation and the final scene cutting into a mini clip of old episodes with butterflies at the bottom. It makes you feel sentimental, especially if you've been seeing the show from the beginning up to this point. The movie came out in 2004, the same year I graduated from high school and entered into college. I was afraid of the change that came from the transition from different schools at first because this was such a huge leap from being an older teenager to a young adult. I would have been surrounded by new people, new classes, and a new setting. But eventually, college became great for me, and I was no longer afraid. While it is true to sometimes hold on to things from your childhood that mean a lot to you, just like I mentioned in Comeback Little Seal Girl, there comes a time in which we all need to take our first uncomfortable step to the next level. Whether it be graduating, getting your first job, moving into a new town, or even a new home outside of living with your parents. It becomes daunting and even terrifying at first. You even doubt if you're even going to make it. But somehow you do. And when looking back on it, it doesn't seem like a big deal anymore. To conclude this discussion, I leave you with a quote from The Wedding Frame. Time gives you a unique perspective as you get older. You see that the challenges that were so scary when you were really young weren't really that scary at all. Looking back, you're glad that you took the risks. Like my mother said, if you don't get a few bruises and scrapes along the way, then you're not really living. And if time teaches us in this crazy world is that nothing worth having ever comes easy. I couldn't have said it any other way.